good day gentlemen a warm greetings to all viewers from himt chennai i am captain neeraj i have sailed uh, primarily on oil and gas tankers and uh, i am associated with uh, himt for the last 2 uh, years today i will take you all through a very exciting uh, presentation of uh, dual fuel ships my video is uh, divided into two parts uh, part one is uh, basic. Uh, basic in this uh, section, we will cover about uh, rules and regulations concerning dual fuel ships. We will talk about uh, use of LNG as a fuel. We will talk about uh, fuel gas supply systems, uh, various elements of fuel gas supply systems. And in the end, we will review about uh, the deck layout of some new delivered uh, dual fuel vessels. In the part two of the video, that will be the basic advanced uh, version of the same uh, part one. In that video, we will discuss about uh, engine room layout. We'll talk about the various uh, safety elements associated uh, on dual fuel ships. And a uh, very key thing uh, we're going to talk about in the part two of the video is the bunkering operation, the step-by-step -step elements that are involved in the bunkering operations. In the end of part two, we'll also take a look into the future where we'll consider uh, various uh, other uh, fuel options that is other than LNG. So without wasting any further time, uh, let's start on to dual fuel ships. What are dual fuel ships? So first thing first, as the name suggests, dual fuel. Dual fuel means these type of ships have two sources of fuel. Source one, that is a low flash point fuel. And source two is a traditional or a conventional oil based. fuel. So these type of ships have two sources of fuel. All their machineries, main engine, auxiliary engines, boilers, which consumes this fuel, they can run 100% on dual fuel, on dual fuel, that is, they can run 100% on fuel one, that is low flash point fuel, and 100% on uh, source of the fuel, second source of the fuel, that is a traditional or conventional oil based fuel. So these machineries are designed in such a way that they can run on both the fuels independently. Why we need dual fuel ships? That is the next thing to discuss about. So in order to understand the need of dual fuel ships, we need to understand some of the international treaties. That is United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, popularly called as United Nations SDG 17 goals. And then followed by Paris Climate Agreement. And the last IMO Greenhouse Gases Reduction Strategy. All these international treaties are aiming towards carbon neutrality, that is zero carbon emissions to the atmosphere. That is what the all these three international treaties are basically talking about. Let's start with the first one, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it is adopted in 2015, signed by 193 nations. Sustainable Development Goals consist of 17 goals, goal 13 and goal 14 these are the two goals that majorly affects the uh, shipping industry that is air pollution and water pollution <clears throat> in the same year 2015 in the month of december even higher number of countries 196 countries signed for paris climate agreement paris climate agreement focus primarily on goal 13 of united nations sustainable development goals the objective of Pri uh, paris climate agreement is that the temperature of the earth should not increase beyond 2 degree as compared to the pre-industrial era. Although the aim is 1.5 degree, 2, 2 degree is the higher level. So both of these are interrelated. United Nations Sustainability Development Goals followed by Paris Climate Agreement. And finally, international shipping. So how international shipping is associated with both of these two? So international shipping accounts for about 2.2% of the global greenhouse gases emission. So IMO was compelled to adopt IMO greenhouse gases strategy in compliance with United Nations Sustainability Development Goals and Paris Climate Agreement. In 2018, in the month of April, IMO came out with GAG reduction strategy, that is greenhouse gases reduction strategy. As compared to the CO2 emissions in 2008, IMO aimed to reduce the emissions up to 40% by 2030 
and up to 50 percent by 2050. And at the end of this century, IMO wants the shipping to go green, that is zero carbon emissions from the shipping industry. For the many of you viewers, this timeline looks quite good, quite a heavy time in your hand. But actually, if you think as a ship owner, as a ship owner in 2022, if you are placing an order of the ship, which will be delivered in the coming one or two years, in the very near future, you have to comply with 40% reductions of CO2 emissions, that is 2030 regulations. And before the ship goes to the scrap, you need to comply with 2050 regulations. The questions which bother ship owners is whether do we have this technology, do we have this commercial viability to comply with this regulations? I will answer these questions later in the presentation, but uh, please pause the video for a minute and have a thought about it. The major component of the air pollution that emits from the ship is sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, particulate matters, and CO2. The NOx emissions, SOx emissions, particulate matters, and CO2. Out of these four, the three, the first three, that is the NOx emissions, SOx emissions, and particulate matters are majorly concerning the local environment. That is, they affect the local environment in majority. However, the CO2 emissions not only affect locally, does not affect only that particular location, but affects the entire climate altogether, you know. So, what we should do to reduce this air pollutants, what we should do to lower the emissions of NOx, SOx, particular matters and CO2. We have a number of options to use the low flash point fuels starting from LNG, methanol, biodiesel, hydrogen, ammonia, and many more. But the question again, is it economical? Is it commercial viable to use any other fuel? The answer to this question is, as of now, LNG is the one fuel which lowers the emissions to a very good level. And it is technologically, it is environmentally, and it is economically feasible to use LNG as a fuel. By using LNG as a fuel, out of the four components we have discussed earlier, we are able to reduce SOx and particulate matters, that is sulfur oxides and particulate matters up to 99%, the NOx emissions up to 80%, and CO2 emissions up to 25%. Please understand that these figures are when we are having the best use of available technology. Not all the technology by the use of LNG can reduce NOx, SOx, particular matters, and CO2 to the above mentioned figures. You know, the best use of technology that we have as of now can reduce our and uh, reduce our environmental footprints to the this level. What is LNG? So basically, LNG is a gas that is a vapor which has been converted into liquid. There is a change of state, a vapor that has been converted into liquid. This liquid state of the fuel is referred to as LNG, liquefied natural gas. A natural gas that has changed its state from gas to liquid. How it has changed its state? It has changed its state by the, by the reduction of temperature. So we have reduced the temperature to negative 162 degrees Celsius. Hence, this gas has been converted into liquid. Why we need to convert it into liquid? <clears throat> and the reason is quite obvious. In liquid state, it will occupy less space and it will be easy for transportation and carriage. However, please take note, the machineries which are consuming this fuel, they are not consuming in liquid state. They are consuming into gas state. So we must have a processing system on board which will process this liquid into gas. So we are taking liquid, we'll process it into gas, and then it will send it to machinery. That is where LNG is utilized. That is how LNG is utilized on board a rail vessels. LNG, physical properties, it is colorless and odorless liquid. Chemical properties, in liquid state, it is non-toxic, non-flammable, non-explosive, and non-corrosive. Please understand, we are talking about liquid state. What are the major hazards of LNG? The major hazard, hazard is cryogenic hazard. 
cryogenic means since lng is in the liquid state the temperature is negative 162 degrees celsius ultra low temperatures hence if the lng leaks if it makes a contact with the human body or the bare metal both are very harmful if it contacts with a human being any part of your body in that case cryogenic burns can take place with a lethal if it makes contact with the bare metal the hull of your vessel again brittle fracture can take place the entire hull can get cracked another hazard of lng fire hazard so in liquid state as i all as i earlier told you all it is not a, a very easy to catch fire but in a vapor state it can catch fire when it is mixed with air in the ratio of 5 to 15 percent that is the range of flammable range of lng lng fire are of various types it can range from jet fire flash fire cool fire and finally bleed each type of fire is different each type of fire has its own way to fight hence in the igf training if you note there is a practical element of firefighting this is an add-on firefighting training that we need to go to understand each and every type of fire that is associated with lng if i talk about jet fire jet fire generally takes place at the source of heat if i talk about flash fire it takes place in the air without in contact with any liquid pool fire takes place on the surface of the liquid and finally, the lethal most, that is bleed, that is boiling liquid, expanding vapor explosion, the entire containment system explodes. And this is very, very dangerous for the firefighters. There is a very specific requirement under IGF board for a firefighting training for to all the uh, trainers. You know, So you must train your trainers for firefighting if you talk about uh, LNG fire. Other hazards of LNG, if we talk about some other hazards of LNG, that is rapid phase transitions, rollover, also called as stratification, trapped volume, contaminations, oxygen deficiency. We will talk about all these hazards one by one in the coming uh, video. Now we talk about the rules and regulations that are associated with the dual fuel ships. The main pillar of all, IMO, that is IMO IGF code, is one of the major it carries this code carries the major requirements of dual fuel ships there are add-on requirements by classification society industry best practices are mentioned in sgmf guidelines that is society of gas as marine fuel msa guidelines for bunkering operation still a very pioneer uh, guidelines and these guidelines are majorly adopted by all the companies in their sms uh, procedures there are port specific guidelines and checklists on top of all these rules and regulations starting with igf code igf code stands for international code of safety for ships using gases or other low flash point fuel igf code was adopted by solas in june 2015 hence igf code is mandatory for all ships which are constructed after january 2017 and are designed to use dual fuel it is also mandatory for ships which are constructed prior january 2017 but retrofitted to use dual fuel. So IGF code is one of the major code which consists all the regulations and the safety features of the dual fuel ships. IGF code is divided into 19 chapters. Chapter 19 is the one which concerns about training. Classification society rules, these are add-on rules on top of the IGF requirements. Many of the classification society have some specific rules and regulations, especially in, in terms of positioning of gas detection sensors and other uh, safety elements. The Society for Gas as Marine Fuel, popularly called as SGMF. This is a, basically an NGO and it uh, promotes the industry best practices in the use of gas as marine fuel. This society is also has a consultative status with IMO. If you all viewers have some time, I will request you all to visit the SGMF website. And this website contains a healthy amount of information for uh, dual fuel ships. You know, the checklist and all, these are all free of cost available on their website. As I earlier spoken to you all, EMSA guidelines is one of the pioneer guidelines for dual fuel ships. And uh, these guidelines are popularly adopted in uh, many of the company's SMS procedures, you know, 
how to do the bunkering and what are the various elements in the practical bunkering aspects. These are covered by AMSA guidelines. On top of it, the flag and PSC requirements are there. Each of the flag and PSC have their own certain specific requirements for dual fuel vessels. Now, we come to one of the practical elements of dual fuel ships, that is fuel gas supply system. First of all, let us understand what is FGSS, what is a fuel gas supply system. So fuel gas supply system is a complete system compromising of LNG storage tank, fuel processing system, bunker station, and control and safety system. So it means fuel gas supply system is complete system which deals with storage, processing, and the consumption of fuel on board your vessel. As a seafarer working on these type of vessels, if you want to refer to a manual to check uh, how your dual fuel ships are is working, where are the elements of the fuel gas supply system, you need to refer to a manual which will be titled as FGSS, fuel gas supply system. Fuel gas supply system consists of bunkering station, storage, pumps, vaporizers, valve systems, pumping system, pipeline systems, and finally the gas valve unit systems. All the systems will be mentioned in your manual, which will be called as fuel gas supply system. Let's look into the first element of the fuel gas supply system that your bunkering manifold. So if you look at a bunkering manifold, can you notice something different than a traditional oil bunkering uh, manifolds? There are many features here. Let's start from the extreme left. If you can notice, you will find a, a special type of coupling called as dry cryogenic coupling, followed by insulation flange, followed by a cryogenic breakaway couplings, called as ESD couplings, followed by a hose saddle transfer hose. And similarly, on, on the other side of the vessel, we'll also have some controls, PERC controls, fall arrests, and also vessel separation devices. The bunkering manifold is generally on board most of the vessel, you will find there are two manifolds. One will be for the liquid line and one will be dedicated for your vapor line. Both these manifolds will be protected with a water curtain. Water curtain, why? Because this will prevent your vessel hull from brittle fracture in case of any leakage. They will have a drip tray that is will be specially built with stainless steel material to handle cryogenic liquid in case of there is any leakage. The second element of the fuel gas supply system is storage. Under IGF code, there are four ways to store LNG on board your vessel, four types of storage. That is independent tank type A, tank type B, tank type C, and the integral or the, or the integrated type membrane. So we got four of these types of storage space, storage designs basically. Tank type A, B, and C are independent types. It means the tanks are independent of the hull. Whatever forces your hull will encounter and whatever forces your tanks will encounter, they will be different. Whereas integrated tank type, that is a membrane type tank, it means your hull and tanks are integrated into one. Whatever forces or stresses your hull will encounter, same stresses and forces your tanks are also going to encounter. Out of these four types, the two types which are commonly used are tank type C and membrane type tank. So these two types commonly found on board majority of dual fuel vessels. However, seldom you can encounter tank type A and tank type B as well. Tank type C is one of the design which is very popular in the industry. And just to give you an idea, about 90% of the tankers and bulk carriers sailing or on order, that is for dual fuel ships, have tank type C. What type of vessels we are talking about? Tanker and bulk carrier. Tank type C are also having subtypes. That is, they can be either foam insulated or vacuum insulated. When I say vacuum insulated, means there is a tank inside a tank. It is ideal for a smaller uh, vessels and they are generally associated with tank connection spaces. An expensive design. Basically, a POC foam insulated, these you can generally find on ocean going vessels. And uh, these are commonly found on tankers and bulk carriers. The other type of design which is commonly found is GTT membrane type. GTT is a French company which is specializes in manufacturing this kind of membrane uh, design. And uh, container vessels are the one 
where you will find most of the GTT membrane type of tanks being installed. Although there is a research and development and there are trial vessels where membrane type of vessels are, membrane type of tanks are also installed these days. Now, the next thing to talk about is the location of these tanks, where this tank should be located. So in an unforeseen circumstances of uh, collision, ungrounding, fire, my tanks will remain protected. IGF code chapter five deals with this specific question. IGF code chapter five gives you the specific requirements. What should be the position of the tank? From the bottom, the tank should be positions minimum two meter or breadth by 15, whichever is having higher value. And uh, from the side, the minimum value is breadth by five or 11.5 meter. However, if you happen to be on a vessel where the beam, beam or the depth is less, or you happen to be on a passenger vessel, in that case, you have a different set of formulas to calculate and know the location of your uh, tanks. These are further uh, classified in the classification society regulations. Let's look into these three vessels. The vessels on the left, extreme left, is a tanker vessel, then followed by a bulk carrier that is on the right-hand side. And finally, at the bottom, we have a container vessel. Can you notice the tanker vessel, which is on the extreme left, have their tanks forward of accommodation. The bulk carrier have their tank storage system right on the poop deck, that is aft of accommodation spaces. And the container vessel have these tanks below their main deck. Any reason for this? The reason is quite obvious. None of them want to compromise on their cargo carrying capacity. Cargo carrying capacity is your dollar earning capacity. So nobody wants to compromise on that. Hence, the ideal location of the tank would be in such a way that it complies with IGF code requirement and it also does not affect your cargo carrying capacity. It will change and it will vary depending upon the type of your vessel. The third type, the third element of the fuel gas supply system is vaporizer. What is vaporizer? Vaporizer is basically a heat exchanger. What it exchanges? It changes the form of LNG. You remember, LNG is in the liquid state. We must convert it into vapor state before my machinery consumes it. So this is the vaporizer is the heart of the processing system, which converts this liquid LNG into vapor state. So this conversion is done into an equipment which is called as vaporizer. Vaporizer converts liquid into vapor. The fourth element of the fuel gas supply system is a cryogenic pump. What are pumps? Pumps is used to transfer liquid from point A to point B. These are special built and special designed pumps. And these pumps are the one which uh, can be either submerged inside the liquid. It can be a deep well pump, it can be mounted on top, it can be mounted on the sides. There are various designs and various ways to mount these pumps. Let's look into these three designs. In one of the design on the extreme left, you can see the mounting is on the top. The one on the left side is a submerged type of pump that is associated with a GTT tank types. And finally, we can also see a design that is side mounting. It is generally associated with a tank connection spaces. So there are various ways your tanks can be mounted. There are various types of tanks. There are various designs that goes into uh, pumping of this uh, cryogenic liquid. Now comes to the fifth element of the fuel gas supply system. That is fuel preparation room. So fuel preparation room is a dedicated room dedicated space which contains pumps, compressors, vaporizers and other elements associated with the fuel preparation purposes. It is treated as an enclosed space and they have a stringent requirement under IGF code for gas detection, ventilation and fixed firefighting system. This is the main deck of one of the tanker vessels delivered in 2022. Can you all viewers uh, highlight to me or highlight to yourself where is the what type of tank we are talking about and where is the fuel preparation room. The one which is highlighted in the yellow is the fuel preparation room. If you look carefully, you will notice the ventilation trunks that is on the top of the space. What type of tanks is it? These are PUC foam insulated IMO tank type C. So in this uh, <clears throat> photograph, we can also see that the fuel preparation room the red color box that is outside the room is a fixed firefighting system which is associated with this fuel preparation room. 
this is the inside view of the fuel preparation room. Fuel preparation room have a stringent requirement of ventilation. That is, they have 30 air changes per hour, one of the requirement of the IGF code. The one which is highlighted in the yellow here is the vaporizer. You all guys remember what is a vaporizer? Vaporizer is an equipment which converts liquid into vapor. A new term to learn, tank connection spaces. So what is a tank connection space? Fuel preparation room, if your ship is long, if your ships have good beam, definitely you can have a fuel preparation room in between the tanks. But what if you are on a smaller vessel? What if you are on a vessel where the beam is less, the length of the vessel is less? So do you think you will have a space to mount a fuel preparation room? You will have a space to put a fuel preparation room. So in these kind of vessels where we do not have a space to put fuel preparation room, we use a compact version of it. So this compact version of fuel preparation room is referred to as a tank connection spaces. So tank connection spaces are mount, are constructed together with the tank and they contain all the fuel processing systems, including the connections of the tank. That is the inlet, outlet, pumps, vaporizers, everything is mounted in the tank connection spaces. Again, there are specific requirements for tank connection spaces. That is, they are treated as an internal space they have a gas detection system, fire fighting system, and also a ventilation system. So in short, we can call tank connection spaces are alternate for fuel preparation room. This is one of the tank connection spaces. Uh, this is a design of man. And you can see all the system that is required to process the fuel is mounted in the tank connection spaces. What type of tanks? Generally, tank connection spaces are associated with vacuum type, vacuum insulated IMO tank type C. The next term to learn here is PBU system. So what is the PBU system? PBU stands for pressure buildup unit. If I ask you all question, how can I transfer a liquid from point A to point B? The answer is very obvious by using a pump. The other way to transfer the liquid from point A to point B is by using the pressure. So if I put a constant pressure, on my pumps, on my sorry, on my tank, then the liquid will transfer from point A to point B if I maintain the pressure. So if a ship owner does not want to install a pump, in that case, we can use a pressure buildup unit. So pressure buildup unit maintains a constant pressure inside the tank. And because there is a constant pressure in the tank, the liquid starts to transfer from point A to point B. If your ships happen to consume the fuel in a low pressure, in that case, PBU systems can be used and it is suitable only for the ships with tank type C having tank connection spaces instead of fuel preparation to uh, type of uh, LNG vessels that is dual fuel diesel electric ships. These are the one where we have a PBU systems installed on board the vessel. Even they are not dual fuel ships, but you can find them there, over there. So PBU systems are basically an alternate arrangement, alternate pumping arrangements if you don't want to install a pump. The eighth element of the fuel gas supply system is a gas valve unit. Gas valve unit basically controls the gas feed pressure and it depends upon the load of the engine. So if your main engine is working on uh, dead slow ahead and your main working is main engine is working on full ahead, is the pressure, uh, is the consumption of the fuel will remain the same? The answer is no. Why? because the load of the engine is changing, hence the demand of the fuel will also change. So this demand is met by gas valve unit, depending on, it judges what is the load on the engine and based upon the load, it gives you the supply of the fuel. So gas valve unit is basically the fuel control valve. It controls the amount of fuel that is, uh, that is demanded by the machinery. So how many gas valve unit do we need? So we need gas valve unit for each of the machineries. Your main engines will need it separate. Your auxiliary engines will need it separate. Your boilers will need its own gas valve unit. So how many gas valve on board you will find? You will find multiple gas valve units. In this photograph over here, you can see the one highlighted with the yellow arrow. These are the gas valve unit for the four auxiliary engines. And gas valve units are not only the one which controls the flow of the fuel, but it is also a safety device in case of any emergency, in case of maintenance, it cut off the supply of the fuel. If you want to totally cut off the supply of the fuel, you can use your gas valve unit to cut off the supply of the gas to the 
uh, to the your machineries. These are the gas valve unit. So in case of hazardous event, the unit will automatically inert the gas line with nitrogen. So it detects the presence of the flammable or explosive gases inside. Gas valve units can be mounted in a room because we got multiple of these. We do not have single piece. We can have four, five, six of these gas valve units. So they can be mounted in a room. Generally, for dual fuel vessels, they are not mounted in the room. For LNG type vessels, where the cargo is LNG, LNG vessels, they are mounted in a room. For dual fuel vessels, they are mounted in a modular or a compact version. And this compact version or a modular unit, these are placed near to the machineries. So we have covered almost all the elements of the fuel gas supply system. Few pointers to highlight. There can be various configurations of fuel gas supply system. In one configuration, pumps can be used. In one configuration, pressure buildup unit can be used. Each of them have its own advantages. Each one of them have its own disadvantages. But you will not find a ship where we have a standard configuration, a ship with pumping system. So you will not find PBU. It is not possible. You can have ships with pumps, you can have a different vessel you go, you will find a system with pressure buildup units. Here are the two systems which we can encounter commonly. The one which is highlighted in yellow, the one which is on the extreme left. It is a IMO tank type C configuration with a dedicated fuel preparation room, with a dedicated pumps. And the one which is on the right hand side, this is the vacuum insulated tank type C with tank connection spaces, no fuel preparation room here. And, and this is run by the glycol water mixture. The vaporizer is driven by a glycol water mixture. So this is the design that is uh, where, where a man supplies the equipment. This is uh, one of the standard man supplied uh, equipments. Let's review the fuel gas supply system on some of the new delivered vessels. So how this fuel gas supply system looks like on a new delivered vessel. This is uh, one of the oil tanker, one of the world's first dual fuel Aframex tanker delivered in 2018. Let's zoom on to the main deck of the vessel. When zooming in, we can see the manifolds, port and starboard. We can see the vent mask that is associated with the dual fuel pipelines. What type of tank is it? It is a PUC foam insulated IMO tank type C with a dedicated fuel preparation room. And this is the standard uh, equipment fuel gas supply system layout on main deck of the vessel. Let's review the design of a bulk carrier. In this picture over here, all the viewers, can you all see the manifolds? Look at the water curtain at the manifold. No, so you can, you can all see the water curtain that is at the manifold. Let's review on to the poop deck of the vessel. When going on to the aft of accommodation, you can see IMO tank type C, that is PUC foam insulation, again with a dedicated fuel preparation room and a vent mask, which is there in the aft. A question, if you are the ship owner, will you accept this design for the carriage of LNG? If your dual fuel is LNG, will you accept this design? Answer is quite obvious, no. Why? Because in this design, your cargo carrying capacity is compromised. Container vessels. Let's review a design of a container vessel. As I all told you, as I told you all earlier, container vessels, again, they don't want to compromise on cargo carrying capacity. So what type of tanks they have for the carriage of this dual fuel? For the carriage of the fuel, they will have a membrane type of tanks that is housed inside their hull. This is a GTT membrane type tanks with submerged pump and the entire fuel processing system is mounted right on the top of the tank. Car carrier. Car carrier are generally having an IMO tank type C that is foam insulated tanks. Although there are some other designs quite popular, but this is one of the one which is a, you will encounter quite frequently. Passenger vessels. This is one of the passenger vessels which went under retrofit. And uh, to install a low flash point uh, carriage fuel, uh, again, a tank type C. Question to the viewers, does this vessel need to comply with IGF code? The vessel was built prior to 2017. The installation, the 
and retrofitting was done after 2017. Does this vessel need to comply with IGF code? It's time to end the part one of the video. Part two of the video will be the advanced version of the dual fuel vessels. We'll talk about the engine room machineries and all. Before I end the part one of the video, a small information for my viewers and that uh, at HIMT, we are conducting uh, both the basic and advanced uh, IGF uh, courses. There are five days uh, duration of these courses is five days. And uh, if you all are interested in booking the course, please visit the website HIMTMarine.com. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I'm Captain Neewich, and I'm signing off now. I welcome all your feedbacks at the below mentioned email IDs. I hope uh, you managed to learn something new from my video. I will see you all in the part two of the dual fuel ships. Thank you.